Hello and welcome everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, my name is Jackie Gehagen. I'm currently a professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University and the lead on the Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive and the Lesbian Oral History Project. As moderator for today's webinar, it's my pleasure to have you join us for a conversation about LGBT Seniors Archives in the Atlantic region. Now this webinar is meant to share ideas about how we're building and how we continue to build awareness about the rich histories of our LGBT communities in Atlantic Canada. This is an opportunity to highlight some of the work that we're doing and to brainstorm on the way forward. Before we get started, however, I'd like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq and that we're all treaty people. For those of you who may be less familiar with Microsoft Teams, you can ask questions in the chat box and we will go to the Q&A uh, session after the speaker's presentation. So please feel free to add your questions in the box. Uh, and also please note that this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive website after this event. Today, we're so very fortunate to have a group of speakers <clears throat> who are from across the Atlantic uh, region uh, who will be here talking about the work that they're doing to help preserve the histories of our LGBT communities. We'll be starting with Jess Wilton, followed by Rachel Moore, Meredith Batt, Elsa Craig, and finally, Nola Aiken and Kelty McPhail. Uh, I would kindly ask that each speaker briefly introduce themselves, noting that your bio will be in the box beside as you're speaking. Um, please include your preferred pronouns and keep your presentation to five minutes so that we can have time at the end of today's session for a q and I'd like to now turn it over to Jess to get us started. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, my name is Jess. I'm a PhD student studying queer history and archives. And today I'm going to be speaking a bit about LGBT archives, their role in history, connection to community, and kind of relationship to the political. So I'd like to start kind of in the 1990s um, during the archival turn. So just before this, archives were often considered this neutral repository, you know, they were uh, collections of things that were stored and sorted and we didn't really look into whose voices were being silenced. silenced. And so at the archival turn in the 1990s, a interdisciplinary approach kind of took hold where uh, it was no longer just a repository but it had connections, archives had connections to memory, to community, to politics and it became a lot more alive in that sense. And one of the things we really started looking at was the power in deciding which, deciding which records and by extension which voices actually gets recorded and stored and how that directly impacts people and which histories are really told. And so that's kind of where this all ties in with uh, what we're talking about today, the LGBT archives. And so just like in many areas of life, as I'm sure many of us know, LGBT folk, particularly those who are Black, Indigenous, people of colour, have been and continue to be excluded from the archival record. And so in Canada, actually, before the decriminalization of homosexuality in 1969, a lot of the documentation found in institutional archives were criminal records. And that's obviously a stark difference compared to straight counterpoints that were told through diaries and letters and photographs. Now, through the height of the gay and lesbian liberation, usually the 1970s, 1980s, um, various archives across North America and the world were formed. And these focused on LGBT documentation specifically. Uh, for example, in Canada, the archives, formerly known uh, as uh, the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Archives, those formed in 1973 from the back files of the Body Politic Gay Liberation magazine. In the Midwest, there's the Gerber Hart Library and Archives from, it began in 1981 and many, many more. And so whether they're completely community-led, institutionally-led uh, archives, they still share a lot of characteristics by you know, being deeply political a lot of the time, no longer neutral, but um, working for a political cause in support of the community they represent. 
Another important aspect is uh, the, the ephemeral records. So these fleeting records like things that weren't really meant to be saved like condom wrappers and buttons and you know things flyers flyers that were just made to be hung up those have been collected in archives and uh it's what it's something that really draws a difference between a lot of these institutional archives that didn't include lgbt folk because nobody nobody really needed to save that but lgbt folk did and that kind of brings me to my last point which i think will tie in with a lot of other presentations today which is urgency so because we came from a violent and oppressive context, there was already an urgency in creating these archives, in making sure that these stories were not forgotten because they were excluded purposely for so long. And now we're at a point where we've lost so many people to the AIDS epidemic, and now we're losing people to older age as well. And we need to have these stories that were not collected. Um, and that's just kind of how I would like to set up some of the other speakers and um, I think I'll pass that over to Rachel. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm going to try and share my slides. I've been having a little bit of issues here, so we're just going to see if this will work for me. Just a second. Here we go. Can anyone see those? <laughs> I'm going to assume so. Um, so my name is Rachel Moore and I am a research assistant with the Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive. Our archive was founded in 2019 with original funding from the Nova Scotia Department of Seniors. As such, we are an intergenerational project whose mission is to collect, arrange, preserve and make accessible records of the contributions made by LGBT seniors in Nova Scotia. We support teaching and research related to LGBT seniors both at Dalhousie as well as within the broader community. And I work with all the aspects of archival processing and also handle the community facing aspects of the project alongside Jackie. Um, handling this type of material is sensitive work. Historically, archives have had a complicated relationship with marginalized communities due to the potential for misrepresentation. It's scary to think that the materials you've spent your whole life collecting and preserving could be given to an archive that doesn't make an adequate effort to understand or accurately represent the identities and experiences contained therein. An important element of our approach to handling these materials respectfully and accurately is our commitment to maintaining an open dialogue with members of the rainbow community. We hold monthly meetings of our community advisory committee where we invite members of the community to give input on everything from how we describe materials to our donation guidelines and mission statement. Many members of our community advisory committee have been embedded in Nova Scotia's rainbow community for decades and are therefore able to provide essential context to the materials that we've collected. One of the questions you might be asking is why we use the acronym LGBT instead of a longer acronym when there are so many other identities represented within the rainbow community. Terminology is one of the trickier aspects of conducting this kind of archival work as it's constantly changing. So for example, words like queer that used to have a pejorative meaning are now commonly used by members of the community who have reclaimed them to express their identities and new words are added to our cultural lexicon all the time to describe ways of identifying that while they may have always existed, we may not have always had the language to describe. This is further complicated by the differences in the ways these forms of gender and sexuality are conceptualized across languages and cultures. The main reason why we use LGBT is that this acronym is reflective of the named identities that were most commonly claimed at the time these materials were created and collected. We have to be careful not to editorialize through the lens of our contemporary understanding of gender and sexuality or to retroactively impose language onto these materials. However, if a donor uses different terminology to describe themselves, we must be respectful of their chosen identifier. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we structure our font within the archive. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, a font is a group of materials from the same origin that were produced as part of the actions of an individual or an organization. We separate the materials in our repository into fonts so that we can describe them and make them accessible to our archives users. The materials in our repository document the operations of a wide range of community groups and organizations. And initially, we had thought to describe these materials using these groups as the basis for our phone level descriptions. This meant that material from multiple donors would be described and stored together using the name of the group as the name of the phone. 
While this approach provides a snapshot of the activities of these groups, the ultimate result was that the stories of the individuals who created and collected these materials became harder to see. Because of this, we restructured our phone level descriptions of those materials to show a more holistic version of the interactions between individuals and groups and how people floated around within the community. So, for example, one of the font I'm currently processing contains records from a donor who was a member of both leather clubs and also religious organizations associated with the United Church. And if we hadn't kept these materials together, it would be harder to see the complexities of this donor's life and experiences. And um, while we have been lucky enough to receive a large number of donations from gay men in our community, we don't have a comparative wealth of materials from lesbian identified Nova Scotians. In speaking with lesbians across the province, the response we often get is that they don't think they have valuable materials to contribute. One of the reasons for this may be because historically, many activist efforts in the community have dealt more commonly with gay men's issues, resulting in fewer records documenting lesbian experiences and concerns. In order to address this gap, we submitted a grant application to the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage's Strategic Development Initiative to collect oral histories from lesbians across the province. While it's important to preserve records of activist groups and community organizations, the everyday experiences of women and gender nonconforming people are just as valid and important to preserve. This project allows lesbians to share their experiences of things like coming out and falling in love that are just as important to preserve for future generations. So thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, if you want to learn more about our archive, our uh, HTM, or sorry, our link is at the bottom there, and I will pop my email in the chat for anyone who is interested. Over to you, Meredith. Awesome. Can everybody see that OK? No. OK, excellent. Oh. There we go. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Meredith Batt, and I'm a provincial, or I work at the Provincial Archives uh, here in New Brunswick as a private sector records archivist. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, my organization, um, the Queer Heritage Initiative of New Brunswick, and I serve as the president of this uh, of this organization. Um, the Queer Heritage Initiative of New Brunswick, or QHINB, was established in 2016 by Dusty Green when he was doing a summer internship here at, uh, at PANB. Our aim is to collect the queer history of New Brunswick through documents, artifacts, oral histories, um, but we also work to provide uh, public education sessions, uh, giving people uh, the opportunity to learn about stories of LGBTQ plus people from across uh, Canada and, uh, of course, in our own home province. Um, we do focus on LGBT seniors, however, um, we are interested in collecting uh, archival material and oral histories and ephemera from groups um, that have uh, connection to New Brunswick. Um, and we will also collect uh, material from groups, uh, especially when they are no longer extant and have records that they're interested in donating to us. Um, there are a lot of benefits with partnering with uh, the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick, namely the fact um, that uh, the uh, the material is available for people to consult um, Monday to Saturday, nine to five, and all they have to do is uh, come to the archives to, to look at it. Um, and they've been very supportive in this process uh, since we started in, in 2016 by providing the space for our collection. Um, I often receive a number of emails from students, both undergrad and graduate, who are interested in consulting the material for research purposes. Um, we have a board of seven people uh, and I serve as president um, and so I also work to, uh, during my work hours, uh, handle the uh, client inquiries from the public and making the material available. 
Um, just a brief overview of our collection. We currently have 15 sous-fonds. Um, so Rachel gave a great explanation of what font means. Sous-fonds is in a collection. There are many collections that are housed within a, within a collection. So we have uh, 15 mini collections that deal with um, groups or individuals from across the province. And the material ranges from the late mid to late 70s to present day. Um, and includes a lot of um, human rights um, reform, the New Brunswick Coalition for Human Rights m reform material, um, but also um, items relating to Moncton River of Pride, um, which has been around since 1999. Um, we also have some various items to um, relating to the PFLAG, Sackville and Amherst chapter. Um, so kind of a wide variety of things from across the province. We have gaps in our collection. Um, we do have some uh, material relating to the trans plus population, but very little uh, relating to BIPOC groups and individuals. So we are working hard to foster our relationships um, through educational events with these communities and be as inclusive as possible. There we go. So this is just a, a couple items that I've pulled uh, just to give you a, an idea of, of some of the material that we have. So we have photos, but on average, we have quite a number of textual documents currently. And like I said, they span from the 70s until um, almost up to present day. Um, the other thing that I mentioned that we have been um, doing is um, educational events. So it's very important to us to do public engagement activities so that people know um, who we are and uh, the type of work that we're trying to accomplish. Um, Recently this summer, uh, we held another intergenerational panel, so bringing different generations together to talk about their experiences, and we did it on the uh, the history of St. John. Um, so that was a wonderful experience where we had five panelists um, who explained um, some of their background growing up as queer in, in St. John but also their experiences with the first Pride Parade, <laughs> which was held in 2003, um, and how that came about after uh, Member of Parliament Elsie Wayne's comments in the House of Commons. Um, the other uh, thing that we are also working on is a research project research projects, writing articles, and uh, collaborating with other organizations, be it for Pride or other events, such as uh, the work that we're doing today. And I'm just going to advance my slides here to explain another project um, because um, I, like many others, um, grew up in the New Brunswick school system and noticed a distinct lack of uh, queer history in social studies. So we are working with UNB Education on a uh, project called Queer Histories Matter and it's a website that was established uh, for teens but also but mainly for teachers um, K to 12 um, that have lesson plans and aids um, for them but it can also be used by youth and GSAs. Um, if you have any questions I would be more than helpful happy to answer. Um, I've just attached a slide here with our, our email address um, and uh, in the future our plans are really to develop more concrete uh, oral history programs. Um, we've been doing sporadic interviews with um, folks in the community but there really needs to be a more concrete oral history program and we hope eventually to develop a few exhibits. Um, like Rachel mentioned there is a great sense of urgency in collecting this material and we're always accepting new donations. So if you know of anybody or anyone who spent their time in New Brunswick who may have material, please don't hesitate to reach out. And on that note, um, I'm going to pass things over to Elsa. Am I unmuted? <laughs> Um, Elsa, you're still muted. You'll need to unmute yourself again. Perfect. Can you Great. hear me? Okay. Yes. 
I was pressing it and trying the combinations and it wasn't working. Um, uh, my name is Elsa Craig. I'm the, the current interim dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Memorial University. Uh, more importantly for this conversation, I'm also co -founder and, a co-founder and co-chair of Quadrangle NL, which is um, a charitable organization that's working to build uh, a 2 SLGBTQAI uh, community center for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, some of the aims of Quad, um, have, the central aims of Quad, have to do with creating a, a shared space, so creating the, the, a greater possibility for shared public space and public engagement of people within the communities. So the kinds of the kinds of spaces that allow for happenstance as well as for things that are planned, the kind of space that allows for the sharing of stories, the sharing of information, the sharing of resources. Those are the kinds of things that we're interested in doing. Um, in in the province right now, with regard to archives, it's it's really wonderful to listen to what other people are saying here, other things that are happening in the maritime provinces. And I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation and I'm learning a lot um, because there's, there's such a strong impulse towards um, finding a way to collect and preserve our stories. And I can see that impulse and different moves towards it um, from people across the province, but we don't have the sort of the, the centralized work that's yet accomplished. So we're at a very different stage of development um, with that. So that said, there's work that's been done through a Facebook group where people have uh, collected um, photographs. So there, there's, there's, there is some there, but it's not in a central spot that's easily accessible for research. Uh, Daisy Jeffries has, does, has done some really important work um, with, with collecting oral histories. Um, and we've uh, got, well, as we were talking, Meredith, you were talking about the work with the UNB Department of Education, sorry, not with UNB, UNB's work with the Department of Education around what is happening there. And Sue Rose and others have been trying to do lots of really important work that way. But to see people creating a, an archival space which has that, um, that's, that more central accessibility is something which is really helpful. And I know I've appreciated the conversations that I've had with Meredith in the past about how to do this. We also have uh, The Rooms, which is our, our provincial gallery, has just started putting out calls for, does anybody have materials? So um, we're, as a province, at the very beginning stages and with a whole bunch of really strong impulses um, to collect this and it's helpful to think of what the challenges are that other people have faced to see what we can learn from what other people have put together and uh, from my own personal perspective trying to see what it's possible for Quadrangle to do to help support those impulses that are happening across the province right so to try and do what we can to support that um, and direct people towards where they can find the resources or if we can get the core funding that would allow a building having a space that's allocated or if through connections through the university it's possible to have it be because we have multiple strong archives um, here of course at the university so we're looking we're still at the, the point of building those partnerships and that urgency um, that people have mentioned is is something that I really feel. So watching as as generations, sometimes it feels like there's almost like one of those huge, great, big internal mechanisms of a clock and it just goes chunk, chunk, chunk. And I'll see that somebody has passed and I think, oh God, I remember that person telling me this and this and this. Did anybody get them to write it down, right? So there is that sense of time pacing, uh, time passing and having that urgency to it. Um, so there's not a lot that I can point to specifically in terms of here's a website where you can find, but I'm really interested in the conversation that we can have and I want to emphasize how important it is and how much I appreciate this opportunity for there to be collaboration among the Atlantic provinces because I think there's also so much, um, you know, you, you don't start in St. John's and stay in St. John's. Uh, and you don't start, in, particularly in Atlantic provinces, there's a lot of movement across the Atlantic provinces. So I think that there are a lot of shared connections and I really um, am honored to be part of this conversation despite uh, 
still being taking baby steps myself towards working to support archives in the province. So anyway, um, I think I now have to say over to you, Nola, have I got my speaking order correct? And thanks again for the opportunity to participate and I'm looking forward to further conversation. Hello everybody. Um, I'm, there's a song, it's great. Hi, I'm Nola Etkin. I'm the Dean of Science at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, pronouns she, her. So I moved to PEI in 1997 uh, as a, you know, a starting chemistry professor, uh, but was very involved in human rights uh, activism and pride and all that wonderful stuff, um, both before and after I came here. So I've been interested in researching and preserving our history for a long time. Um, if you can show the next slide. Um, uh, but this particular work was oops, was uh, motivated by, in 2018, the announcement of plans to open uh, LGBT Museum in Ottawa, which was supposed to open in uh, 2021. I can only assume that um, the pandemic has slowed things down there if it is going ahead. Um, and I was interviewed um, at the time by CBC with uh, my friend Jim Colbert. You can see him in this picture here. Um, uh, and we showed and shared, you know, two our two very large collections of materials. Uh, collections that include things like uh, newspaper articles like this one, if you can show the next slide. Um, uh, you know, news clippings of, of some events that had happened over the years. So I've been here backtracking about uh, 25 years now and Jim Colbert was here about 10 years before that. Uh, but also in addition to lots of news clippings, uh, archives of some primary documents, if you show the next slide. Um, things like uh, in 1988, when the what was called the Lesbian Collective at the time, um, made a submission uh, in favor of human rights, and then a group that I was involved in a decade later made another submission. So we have a lot of that archival documents of, um, you know, materials that, that have been produced within the community and also some things that have been produced uh, against human rights, for example. Um, if you show the next slide, um, things, you know, a lot of memorabilia around early prides here and um, we had for a few years uh, the Art Quarterly, which was a publication that we had. You can see the, the, the second one there is the first pride issue and we actually sat in a room with colored highlighters and, and colored the rainbow because we couldn't afford color printing at the time. Uh, if you show the next slide, also, also extensive collection of photographs. So these, when Kelty put this slide together, these are um, from events that happened actually just about exactly 20 years ago. And there's a very much younger uh, picture of me and my uh, brand new partner at the time. And we're still there looking not quite so young and lots of lots of friends there. Um, so around, around that time or after this was published in um, on CBC, I was approached by the university librarian Donald Moses with an idea to actually archive the materials locally um, before you know potentially sending them off to a, a national museum. And we at the time planned to seek funds to support the project. Um, COVID did kind of get in the way with that. Um, and then more recently, um, Kelty McPhail, who's on the call here as well, uh, was uh, hired into the role of community history librarian, and she's been assigned to help with this project and to really kickstart things off right now. Um, we're also seeing some interest from the PEI Museum and Heritage in, in uh, having some materials there. So um, we're not as far along as, as the other provinces in these projects, but we were quite excited to do some of this work and I'm really excited to be here and, and uh, you know to listen to what everyone else is doing. I'm going to pass it over now to Kelty McPhail who will talk a little bit more about the library resources and plans there. Excellent. Thanks Nola. Hello.
and I am just going to flip our slides back to the very beginning just in case anybody on the call needs our contact information there. It's on that first slide. Um, as Nola mentioned, I'm the Community History Librarian. I am going to keep this very brief uh, just because I think we're coming up on our time here. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of conversations about different directions that a project around some of this material could take. Um, and where we kind of see the library coming in is uh, leveraging some of our uh, digitization and sort of digital collection infrastructure and expertise. Um, we have a number of collections that are available through the islandarchives.ca project and website. Um, and the thought is we could maybe leverage some of that uh, to pull in um, some of the material from these collections to give them a bit of a boost, both in terms of that really important preservation aspect, but also just in terms of visibility and to really act as a jumping off point for, for some future projects. So we're very, very early, early, early stages, um, but we're excited to be here. It's been really interesting to hear what uh, what other people in other provinces are are working on, and I'm sure we'll probably be in contact and and uh, reaching out to you folks who have a little bit more experience in that area. So I guess the theme of today is kind of stay tuned for us um, in the next months and semester. And if there's anybody from the island online today who's interested in reaching out to us with uh, information or stories or questions, please feel free to do so. Uh, so I think that's it for me and I will hand it back off to, I believe it's Jackie. Great, thanks very much, Kelty. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank each of our speakers for their important contributions to today's webinar and particularly in relation to how we can continue to grow our efforts across the Atlantic region to preserve and share our LGBT histories. Now, before we open it up to questions, um, again, I would like to thank our partners and our funders specifically. I'd like to thank um, the Nova Scotia Department of Seniors who funded the Nova Scotia LGBT Seniors Archive, and also uh, thank you to the Nova Scotia Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage for funding our Lesbian Oral History Project. Thank you as well to, Dal to the Dalhousie University Archive, uh, to the Elderberries, to NSRAP, to HPL, to our past and current team members, including uh, currently Rachel Moore, who you've heard from today, uh, Lydia Hunsberger and Dan McKay, and thank you to our Community Advisory Committee members. Um, I'd also like to thank our production team who worked hard behind the scenes to make this event possible. A big shout out to Marlo McKay, James Wilton, Jolene Reed, Dan Phillips and Gil Unger. Um, and I think what we'll do is open it up to uh, questions and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up. So I think one of the, the questions that I've heard is, why are we focusing on seniors? And I just wanted to clarify that for the funding from Nova Scotia Department of Seniors, it was through their um, intergenerational grants program. So really what it was meant to do was to inspire um, older members of the LGBTQ community to work with younger uh, individuals in order to sort of share our history. So in other words, uh, I would say in some instances, not in all, not in all, but in some instances, uh, younger uh, members of the community may not be aware of the various struggles for uh, legal rights, uh, for recognition in workplaces, etc. Uh, and so this is a really nice opportunity to make sure that that history is not lost, but it's appreciated over time um, through this intergenerational lens. So I think that's um, that's an incredibly uh, important uh, piece of this scenario. And as uh, Rachel also pointed out the idea of uh, getting additional funding to specifically focus on um, older lesbians is really the fact that we have not heard from a lot of older lesbians about their uh, stories and their contributions to life in Atlantic Canada and we think that that's a really significant uh, issue. So we're purposefully seeking um, older lesbians to come forward and, and share their stories with us. Those stories will then be processed and be made available through the Nova Scotia LGBT um, uh, archive and that is uh, accessible, publicly accessible. Um, there are also materials available um, that can be uh, uh, borrowed. Um, and Rachel, I don't know if you want to speak to that. If somebody want to, wanted to borrow duplicate materials, how they could reach out to you for um, kind of what uh, Meredith was talking about, the sort of teaching and learning opportunities in schools. Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. So 
With our duplicates collection, one of the unique things that we've had the opportunity to do is to collect a bunch of extra materials that we are kind of figuring out a way to make that available for uh, the community in ways that the rest of our archival holdings might not be. So for things like displays, educational purposes, we're currently working with our community advisory committee to figure out what the best version of that looks like. But essentially what we've been doing is we've been taking any materials that we think might be of interest to the broader community for those purposes and kind of squirreling them away in a separate place. Um, we're creating the same kind of finding aid that we would have for the rest of our materials, but it's described a little bit differently so that you can find it according to the type of material as opposed to the donor or the organization that it uh, belonged to, but still maintaining that connection to the rest of the material that we have so that if you do see something that's of interest uh, within that duplicates collection that you can then go and do further research about uh, the materials that are associated with that. Um, we're not 100% certain what that looks like yet because it is a little bit of a different uh, service than what the archive usually provides. And so we are kind of in the nascent stages of figuring out how to provide access to those materials, but there is a really great opportunity there to make those things available to the community in ways that archival materials haven't really been before. So uh, looking forward to kind of seeing where that goes. Great. Thanks very much for that, Rachel. Um, we have a question on related to the gender scale and how do you think we can uh, make sure that projects discussing queer history are aware that there are activities here in the Maritimes. Um, they've read some books based on Canadian queer history, acknowledge that uh, had no information from the Maritimes, even <laughs> they tried to describe themselves. Yeah, okay. So thoughts on that? How do we actually make sure that what's out there does uh, include the Atlantic region? And I just want to clarify that when I'm talking about the Atlantic region, I'm talking about all four Atlantic provinces. I'm not talking about Maritimes, which excludes Newfoundland and Labrador. So I'm, I'm going to assume that this person probably means um, you know, across the Atlantic region. So, so did anybody want to speak to that? You know, reading materials, reading books about queer history and basically seeing no information uh, from our region. I see, Jess, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to it a little bit because I've read a lot of those uh, same books that have very small, small mentions of the Maritimes, almost always related to one of the few magazines that were on this side. And I think one of the ways is really uh, building relationships with other LGBT archives across the, across the country and kind of engaging with the community, engaging with historians. So, you know, of course there's like the archives, the CGLA in Toronto, but there's also ones in the prairies and there's one in Quebec and uh, actually I think there's two, you know, and I think that's one step towards is making those connections from the Maritimes, Atlantic provinces uh, to the rest of the country. And then eventually as people kind of start to know that those are there, hopefully they'll be included in more books. Great, thanks for that, Jess. I appreciate that. Other thoughts on this, this notion of kind of, you know, as you hit the Quebec Manitoba border, nothing's happening. So um, yeah, Meredith, I see your hand, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to second what Jess is saying, and there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done too. And, um, you know, just kind of explaining the, the work that we do on a larger scale. Um, QHIMB is really lucky to have um, connections uh, with the archives in Toronto um, and other LGBTQ activists and historians throughout the country. But those those relationships have been fostered over a period of time. They didn't happen overnight. And um, unfortunately, the organization was written about um, in Craig Jennings's wonderful book Out North, but unfortunately the the name of the organization was it was referred to by the old name and it also said that it was like part of a project under Nova Scotia or that's how it was made to sound. Um, but I've been since been able to connect with the author of that book and kind of explain and I think that going forward um, too and like we did start in 
in 2016, but we, we've been growing um, steadily over time. So I think when uh, QHI and B was written about during that time, um, there may not have been as much information available to the authors. So that's something that we're, we're trying, we're cognizant of and we're trying to work on. That's great, thanks Meredith. Um, yes, please, Rachel, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add as well, I think that the more that we kind of band together as an Atlantic community, the more visible we become on a, a national scale. So doing things like this and making these connections between all the initiatives that are happening here, if one of us hears of something or if we have a researcher come to one repository, we can then refer on to the other repositories that we are aware of and that we have connections to. And so strengthening our community and the uh, the building the repositories that we have here in the Atlantic provinces makes us more competitive, I guess, on a national scale or more visible on a national scale and provides us with the opportunity to uh, make more connections outside of Canada because we are not outside of Canada, but in other provinces in Canada. Um, basically, we can kind of share our connections with each other and, and pass those on and, and strengthen our community here as well as with Canada broader. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And most of you um, and probably the audience who are joining this webinar are aware of um, uh, Aaron DeVore's Trans Archive at the University of Victoria, which I had the good fortune of visiting um, uh, a year ago and or two years ago, I guess, given COVID time. Uh, and it was really quite incredible to see the, the amount of material in that collection. And so, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, at some point we can think about how the Atlantic region can build and grow and have something that actually brings what uh, what we see in, in Aaron DeVore's case, you know, visiting scholars from all over the world wanting to come to the Atlantic region to actually study our history and understand more about um, how we uh, LGBTQ plus uh, individuals um, made history in the Atlantic region. Um, I have another question here. Um, oh, sorry, Elsa, did you want to comment first? briefly am i unmuted no. okay good <laughs> so just still muted i just wanted to to build on that that the collection that uh is there from bc from aaron devore with the way that the ways that it travels has also helped build those connections so i know that at memorial university we had part of part of that traveling the traveling show of that archive come and that was paired with uh storytelling from uh Ivan coyote who came and that that has helped to build and spur some of the momentum and to, to help feed that impulse and to give people further direction to it. So echoing um, what somebody else said about the, the importance of doing that outreach and the connection and and doing the, the banding together, I think that that can be really important. So it's just a, I wanted to shout out to Aaron DeVore and yeah, um, no. what that archives can do, yeah. You know, absolutely, and it, and it is a full-time job. So as you know, Aaron DeVore is not just um, the spokesperson for that that archive but he is also in charge of fundraising and keeping things going and organizing visiting scholars so there's lots of moving pieces but i think if we've got a collective in the atlantic region that wants to see more of that happen here um, I, I absolutely agree with what's been said already that we need to to work together and work collaboratively so i'm just going to read um, this next um, it's a comment and then a question. Um, this was a really inspiring and interesting webinar. I thought uh, building materials for teachers and teens to access seems particularly valuable. Are there any plans for a working group to work on content for public education on LGBT history, or are there any projects considering this um, as an option? And I'll say we have done some of that through our archive archival work um, through Dalhousie uh, and in partnership with the Halifax Public Library and with NSRAP and the Elderberries. The idea was actually to bring those materials out into um, the uh, public library system across the province during Pride. But as you know, the last this Pride and last Pride was a bit of a no can do um, because having public displays during the time of a pandemic is not uh, uh, not a good idea. But that is definitely part of what we're hoping to do. And I wonder if there are other folks on this uh, webinar who are who are also doing that work. And I think Meredith, you've you've talked a little bit about that already. But are there other other ways that we can uh, build on public education for teachers and teens around LGBT history? Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks, Jackie. Um, I feel that the creating the website makes it a little bit easier for teachers to to access to, and it can be accessed, you know, twenty four seven or by any GSA, um, which is good. But as for like, it would be amazing to partner for an activity sometime with another uh, group here in the Maritimes, perhaps. Um, the other thing that we've been involved with is um, the CCGSD presentations. So um, the Canadian Centre for Gender and Sexual Diversity, um, they get money every year to go across Canada. And I think they try and do it in two locations. Um, in each of the provinces. Um, so uh, in 2020, we were able to do it at Ecole Saint Anne here in Fredericton. Um, and then this past year it was uh, online. So for the Miramichi and the St. John region. And um, but there even needs to be a bit more awareness, um, you know, and, and getting schools to to really participate. Um, but it's been great going into the classroom and, and talking to teachers and bringing um, some stories or material to to share with the uh, with the schools. Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks for that, Meredith. Um, we have another uh, comment uh, I would suggest from uh, one of our viewers. Uh, I think many seniors are concerned about privacy. Personally, I would be concerned about talking about friends from the LGBT community who are not very open. Same thing with photos, letters, etc. Could you mention the possibility of submitting material to be closed for a stated number of years, maybe 20, 30 or more years? Um, Rachel, did you want to start on that one, please? Yeah, um, so one of the important things that we have to be sensitive to when dealing with these materials is that not everyone can be out or wants to be out or wants to be outed by other people and so because we are dealing with community organizations because we are dealing with people whose lives are complicated maybe they were out at one point and now they're not we have to be aware of those sensitivities and plan accordingly and so we do have uh, spots within our donor agreements where you can request restrictions on materials so if you're not comfortable with having these materials available until after you've died or say after certain members of your family have passed on then we can definitely make arrangements to put restrictions on those materials until such a time as you have uh, decided that you're comfortable with those materials being made available to the public and as well one of the things that we will be doing with our lesbian oral histories project is redacting portions of transcripts if your stories overlap with someone else's story because what we're trying to do is make sure that we give people the space to express anything that they need to express or tell us anything about themselves that they would like to be known while also making sure that we're conscientious of the fact that people's lives do overlap. Not everyone's situation is the same and we do have to make certain concessions within the materials that we have available so that we are being respectful of everyone's lives and experiences. That's great. Thanks very much for that, Rachel. Um, other comments or questions about uh, working with seniors who may be concerned about issues of privacy? Meredith, please. I, I agree with everything that Rachel said, and I just don't want to, I don't want to reiterate um, everything that she said, but it's, um, uh, or I don't want to say repeat what she what she just said I mean um so um no it's like that that's extremely important to us and also making sure that the correct language is used um in the administrative uh history of the the collection or the font or the sous font um and I um I attended during the Moving Trans History Conference, there was a very useful section about um you know describing the records but also describing you know the the donor and, and where the the material came from and and making sure that the administrative um, history is is appropriate um, and and talks about the donor in an appropriate way. Um, but also like it's very important that we have people's um, uh, con consent uh, and especially paying attention to the restrictions uh, and including with oral histories as well too. Um, so we have a special donor form for um, oral histories as well um, where people can can kind of uh, put restrictions too on their their oral histories. 
That's great, Meredith. Thank you for that. Um, we have a, a comment uh, from uh, Carter from the Halifax Regional Municipality School and Heritage Program. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. I was wondering if it would be possible to request the contact details of all of today's speakers. I've only managed to get details of a few speakers and we're looking into making connections as we embark upon future LGBT plus heritage related projects. So to all of the speakers, if you're comfortable um, sharing your email details with Carter, you can pop it in there um, or you can just, you know, let us know that that's OK and we can share that information in your bios afterwards. Um, so uh, just one general question I have for uh, the group and you've got, I'm just going to say 30 seconds to answer. <laughs> Um, so for each of you, the question is, from your perspective, knowing what you know about your kind of where you live uh, and how you've been doing this work in the past, what do you see as the most hopeful way of moving this work forward, uh, you know, in the next five to ten years? So I'm going to just kind of do around the clock. And so Kelty, you're up first on my clock. So what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, just to uh, echo something that was um, brought up actually in one of one of the questions uh, there is just to make the content, whether it's visible online or just more visible in terms of like awareness in other institutions, but even like researchers who may not be affiliated with those institutions or other archives or um, doing research in those specific spaces, um, but just kind of making ourselves a little bit more I guess visible is probably the word I'd use um, and just making sure people understand the material is there because I know at least on PEI and I'm sure the rest of Atlanta Canada is the same way people have all kinds of material and stories sort of squirreled away in basements and in attics and in trunks and all that kind of stuff and sort of pulling some of that out so it doesn't doesn't fall by the wayside as time goes on. Great lovely thank you for that. Uh, Elsa over to you. You're muted. Am I still muted now? It's OK. All right. My, I have a delay when I press the button and when something happens. My apologies. Um, probably for, for Newfoundland and Labrador, the, the first next step is to get a better sense of what's happening, like to have um, to have a sense of who is doing what that is clearer. So even as we were speaking today, I was like, oh, I forgot to mention that there was this and I forgot to mention there was that so that we have a clearer sense provincially in the community of what is on offer so that we are better able to to create the partnerships and solidify the ways that we're organized. So uh, similarly in the way that we would benefit from having the shared community space of a community center, we would benefit from having a better sense of what everybody's up to and how to be able to bring that into each other's consciousness better. So that's, uh, that's our marching orders there. Big, big next steps. Yeah. Um, Meredith, over to you. What are your thoughts on the way forward? Thanks, Jackie. Um, I would really like to see um, more of a concrete oral history program put in place for QHI and B. Um, and so I have I have some ideas about that. Um, but uh, getting a good group of volunteers together is really important, especially when you're dealing with um, people's stories um, and people's personal lives too. So that's extremely important. Um, but I would also say that I'm I'm keen. It's come up this year for the first time. Somebody's been interested in doing an exhibit with QHI and B material, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. And um, it would be great to help support that. Um, so. Um, kind of working on perhaps putting together mini or micro exhibits, um, maybe creating some, I call them banner bugs, but they're pull-up banners, um, <laughs> or panels would be really amazing to have to take with us or that an organization could have on display during Pride Week, maybe about the, the city or the location and some Pride uh, events that happened in the past. Um, it's been awesome presenting today with um, with my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, it's been really amazing to hear what everybody has to say, especially Elsa and Nola um, and Kelty. It's been great hearing from you and uh, and I hope that we get to work together again soon. Great. Thanks, Meredith. 
Uh, Jess, over to you. Um, well, I would definitely see kind of one step forward would be um, a really comprehensive history of the Atlantic provinces, like uh, the LGBT history of the Atlantic provinces, since we you know, aren't involved in so many of, of the books, of the research, kind of extending that outwards and looking at you know, the way people have moved from Toronto out to the Atlantic provinces and back and all of these different kinds of uh, influences and traveling and all of that, so. Great, thanks Jess. Uh, last thoughts, Nola, over to you please. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, you know, I really enjoyed the this conversation and I think the way, the way forward for me is to continue this conversation you know, with this group of people and with other people who, who are interested. I think that by working together, we can advance things much more. Um, you know, yes, you know, I, I picked up a, a beautiful looking book in, in Indigo during Pride Month and, and I mean, it's so Ontario centric that it, it I mean, I spent, you know, eight years in, in Alberta and it wasn't much better the coverage for there either. So I think working together, um, I always thought we should have a, a, an Atlantic Provinces Pride tour and, you know, I think we could have a tour of, you know, museum and archival uh, information. I think that'd be really exciting. So, happy to work with all of you. That's wonderful. Thank you for that, Nola. Uh, Rachel, over to you for last words. Yeah, I think the thing that I'm kind of most excited to see is where our project continues to go because I think we have a lot of really exciting things that we're just beginning to build and I think with more resources and with more participation from our community we could really make this something that is a very valuable resource within the community even more so than it already is um, so the more people who want to be involved and, and provide you know, community support or input, the more that we can kind of accurately represent the community and the better we can learn how to direct our operations so that it suits the needs of the community and the researchers here. So if anyone is interested at all in participating in our community advisory committee or getting involved in any way, I'm certainly happy to hear from anyone at all uh, and figure out a way to kind of work you in if there's any interest there. So certainly feel free to get in contact with me if there is any desire to participate in any way. That's great. Thanks very much for that, Rachel. Uh, and so we are just a little bit after the hour, so I wanted to wrap up by saying again a uh, sincere thank you to each of our speakers for their amazing presentations and for sharing their insightful comments and thoughts uh, on how to capture our histories from across the Atlantic region and preserve them and share them. And again, thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you. Take good care. Bye.